It's November 15, 2002. We're in Harrison, Ohio at the Harrison Library. With me is Joe McFadden and Betty Whitesign. And we are interviewing John Herman. John, will you tell us where you were born and when? Okay, I was born in Cincinnati in Montford Heights, actually, in uh, January 19, 1921. And uh, after I gradu graduated from high school, uh, which was in 1939, uh, European War had already started. But uh, I went to uh, uh, to UC and I was uh, taking the architectural uh, courses and uh, uh, at the end of my two and a half years uh, the war was, uh, I knew that uh, I would be uh, drafted if I didn't enlist so in 1942 uh, the summer I think it was in July, I went down to Lexington, Kentucky at UK, and I enlisted in the Army Air Force. And uh, they had some 100,000 uh, young fellas that had signed up throughout the country on that. And so in six months later, I uh, got the notice to report. And so I reported to uh, Fort Benjamin Harrison in uh, Indianapolis, and, and then got shipped down to uh, Miami Beach and uh, for reassignment, and was sent up to uh, Slippery Rock, Pennsylvania. And the reason they did that, they they shipped 500 of each uh, cadet groups to different locations throughout the country, and then they would pull these out of the training colleges. Uh, a hundred at a time, and then uh, they would proceed on through uh, the training courses. Well, I went from classification in Nashville down to Maxwell Field to Douglas, Georgia, and then uh, to uh, Bainbridge, Georgia for basic and Mariana, to, and I was commissioned down there as a second lieutenant. Uh, after that, uh, I went to uh, Venice, Florida for uh, tactical uh, fighter training. And by the way, that was the same airfield that the terrorists were uh, taking flight lessons that uh, uh, run into the uh, World Trade Towers. Well, after that, uh, uh, I was uh, went over, sent overseas on uh, July of 1944 arrived at our unit in, uh, uh, and then we went to, uh, landed at Naples and then from Naples they flew us over to uh, our uh, 12th or 27th um, uh, fighter bomber group. Now the group that I was with uh, at the time uh, was the 12th Tactical Air Force meaning that uh, we supported frontline troops, uh, uh, we uh, interrupted uh, communications, uh, trucks, uh, bombing bridges, uh, uh, strafing trucks and things like this. But anyway, it was a 524th fighter squadron and we also had two other uh, fighter squadrons, a 522nd, 523rd. Uh, the original uh, group uh, that uh, uh, was with uh, was originally uh, organized back in 1940 and in 1941 in November they were sent to the Philippines to protect the Philippines from possible invasion uh, and as uh, the, the pilots and ground crew were sent over there by ship. They got there before December the 7th, but uh, when the Japs attacked Pearl Harbor in, on December the 17th, the planes hadn't even arrived yet, so the pilots and ground crew became ground troops, and most of them were, were either killed or taken prisoner. So uh, 
the group was then reformed back in the United States and uh, in uh, the invasion of North Africa they were sent over there to uh, as fighter uh, fighters and fighter bombers to protect and work with the ground troops from uh, from North Africa they went into Sicily and then up to Salerno into Rome and then were based over on Corsica and th this is where I joined the group so I had uh, back in the United States, I was flying P-40s for transitional training to fighters. And the P-40 was about 1,250 horsepower and about 7,500 pound plane. Well, got over there and uh, looked down on the base when we flew over it, and here were P-47s. And they, uh, their engines were 25 horse, uh, 2,500 horsepower, twice as big, the plane would almost twice as heavy as, as uh, the P-40 that we had been transitioned on. And uh, having not seen uh, the plane before, we didn't know anything about it. But that afternoon when we got over there and landed there in the morning, I, they said, uh, go out and get acquainted with the cockpit and everything, because tomorrow you're going to take it up and, and see how, how it flies. Well. Uh, I went out there and I looked over everything and uh, no one told us a thing about this plane. They, they assumed that we had had transitional training on the P-47 back in the United States. Well, a couple of days later I took the thing up for the first flight and got up about 10,000 feet and, uh, and the engine quit. And I couldn't figure out what it was, and uh, nobody told us, you know, the gasoline consumption on the thing. So I thought, I wonder if I can be out of gas on on uh, the tank that I was on. Now, we the planes were equipped with two wing tanks and a belly tank uh, for just uh, cruising uh, and, and, and escort mission. But we never did escort. We, uh, but anyway, I switched tanks and the plane uh, engine started. And so that was my first experience with the P-47. So uh, on, uh, on uh, the, uh, I think it was August the 6th, I went on my first mission and uh, we were supposed to bomb some anti-aircraft guns up in the mountains of Italy. And uh, there were uh, uh, four planes that went in, uh, eight planes that went in, but the, uh, each group had four, four uh, aircraft. And I was flying number three, er, number four on my uh, uh, element leader was uh, uh, Lucier, and he was from uh, from San Francisco. And just as we pulled over to wing over and go into our dive bomb run, uh, he got a, a burst of 88 millimeter right on the bottom of his plane and he started le uh, leaking uh, fluid. Uh, so when he pulled out of the dive, by, uh, uh, he uh, ac acknowledged that he was having a problem with the plane and uh, he ditched it in the Mediterranean Sea. And they circled him for a while, and uh, uh, or we circled him and, and gave his location. By uh, they picked him up with a PBY, and that night he was back in the in the camp. Well, that uh, that's the uh, the first encounter, and, and when I, when I saw this right before my eyes on the first mission before we ever did anything, <laughs> uh, why I knew what war meant. It was either them or us. And so at that point, I had no qualms about shooting it at any uh, military target or anything like that. Well, uh, on 18th of August of 1944, uh, our troops invaded southern France. And at that point, we flew from Corsica over Marseille and that area where they were landing and we flew top cover for them. And uh, one of our missions was bomb uh, a harbor uh, gun that was uh, sort of 
holding up uh, uh, the invasion troops and the ships and that. So uh, that was, uh, uh, we went into a dive bomb run from 18,000 feet, uh, which was excessive because we usually do that at 10,000, but they said we were going to get all kinds of anti-aircraft fire to be holding them. Well, we, we didn't get shot at all. So uh, a few days later we landed, uh, our group moved to southern France and uh, they, uh, we landed in the hayfield. And uh, then a few days after that we moved, uh, moved the group over to uh, Salon in uh, southern France and we operated out of a uh, a German flying school that they had uh, just north of Marseille. And from there, we, uh, the Germans were retreating up through the Rhone Valley, uh, and uh, <clears throat> we caught them on the, on the Rhone, Rhone River, and uh, there were other tactical fighter groups, the 79th and the 86th, that also worked over this area, and uh, the object they had a convoy going north, and of course, uh, our, one of our tactical um, missions was to prevent supplies from coming to the troops on the ground, or supplies like gasoline for trucks and tanks and things like this. So once they couldn't get those supplies down to their uh, uh, vehicles, uh, they used horse-drawn they hooked horses to these vehicles, and and once you would uh, uh, destroy the first vehicle in the line, then they, they'd clog up the road while they were all sitting ducks. So they had this entire line of traffic uh, tied up along the Rhone River, and, and these three groups, the 27th, 79th, and 86th, worked them over, and. Uh, from a, a friend of mine was uh, in the ground troops, and he said, "Yeah, I saw those." He said, "The whole string of burnout vehicles and stuff like that." Well, we moved from there up into Lyon, and operated out of Lyon, France, for a while in the, uh, southern Germany and eastern France. There, and in uh, November. Uh, we moved back into Italy and we worked over that area uh, throughout the winter up until late February. Uh, one time we were up and we had a, a mission to, to bomb a bridge or something up in, in uh, northern Italy and uh, uh, there was no, no, uh, no trouble whatsoever, no anti-aircraft or anything, but when I came back uh, the planes would come back and they'd form a, uh, they'd come back over the, the approach leg and then peel off and make a, a, a couple of 90 degree circles to the left and you'd come back on the approach to the, to the airstrip. And uh, so I'm over this little town of Kashina and uh, on the approach leg going about 150 mile an hour at the time and the engine quit. And uh, I uh, immediately thought I'm out of gasoline again. And uh, I switched uh, gasoline uh, tanks and uh, gave full throttle and full crop pitch and everything. Now I'm only about 500 feet high at this point. So uh, uh, while I was doing this, I was looking for a place to land. And the only place to land was between two rows of houses and a vineyard. And so I started to turn off of that, and the more than I start turning off, the engine picked up again. So I went back on the approach, and uh, uh, and the more than I did that, the engine quit, and the prop was just uh, stationary in the front. Well, at that point, I had no choice but to try to make the field. And uh, I have a picture of all the old uh, concrete rubble that our uh, bombers had uh, bombed out the airfield prior to us taking the, over there. And I landed right at the end of the runway and rolled halfway down 
the runway and, and the plane stopped and uh, uh, the intelligence officer wrote that that was about as close a call as anybody could ever have because it was a matter of a few seconds of that engine running again that probably got me to the end of the strip. Well, throughout the, uh, the winter then we worked over in North Af uh, northern Italy, uh, uh, bombing bridges, guns, uh, dive bombing uh, and strafing, anything that we could find, especially trains, because trains were supplying the, the German troops in northern Italy. Uh, we uh, even bombed in the Brenner Pass and when you'd look up in the Brenner Pass and see cliffs on each side of you, I, you only had one way to go in and one way to get out. Uh, one of the missions that uh, we had in northern Italy, a friend of mine from uh, uh, Jim Rudolph from uh, Dayton, he was, uh, he and I, uh, there were eight planes, but he and I went down. He said, I saw a train down here headed from Venice to uh, Bologna. Uh, let's go down and get it. So we went down, came in on the plane, er, on a train, and uh, we started in range to shoot. And, and here they were, uh, they had a, a train with some flak cars on the back and they start shooting at us. Uh, and uh, so uh, Jim Rudolph was a, a, a wild man with a, a plane. And so he said, let's go up here and let's turn around and let's go back and get them. And that was, uh, uh, actually, uh, you weren't supposed to be doing that because by that time they were ready for you. So when we came uh, uh, in, there were two trains, one headed east, one headed west. And he said, you take the locomotive and I'll take the flak car. And so uh, we got into shooting range and again they started shooting at us. And we, uh, we had eight machine guns, 450, 425 rounds of 50 caliber. So we had uh, uh, both uh, planes firing at that. And uh, uh, I blew up the locomotive and he silenced the uh, anti-aircraft and uh, that was uh, uh, the end of that mission there then. So eventually we moved back over on t into uh, uh, France uh, because it was getting spring there for the spring offensive there. And we were stationed up at uh, Nancy, at Dijon first. And then as the troops moved uh, to the east, well, we moved, uh, moved to uh, Nancy in France. And from there we worked over uh, the uh, troops in uh, eastern France and uh, uh, parts of Germany. And again, uh, we, we caught them in, uh, uh, down in the, a valley with a single road and, uh, and all of the uh, uh, German uh, vehicles and tanks and that trying to uh, retreat. They got, you, you got the first one and the last one and everybody else was just sitting there waiting to be uh, fired on. So uh, the entire Air Force in that area worked them over. And then uh, uh, we were uh, working into uh, Germany uh, at this point and, uh, and uh, we shoot up barges, trains, uh, supporting the troops and things like this. Uh, and uh, uh, towards the end of the war, uh, this was in April then, uh, we were uh, uh, attacking aerodromes and marshalling yards and everything like that. And so uh, on my 100th mission, I was leading the squadron and we were supposed to go in and attack the marshalling yards. And uh, uh, so we did that and then after that we were supposed to uh, go on an armed recce, meaning you could sh shoot up any military target that you could find. Uh, and, and, and doing this armed recce, uh, we saw uh, a long line of people walking along the highway 
And so I, I and my wingman, I said, let's go down and see what's going on down there. So we went on down at uh, sort of treetop height, and we looked, and uh, there were a whole bunch of, of uh, we estimated a thousand uh, uh, POWs, uh, uh, and they held up a, a sign on the cardboard uh, with red letters POWs. And so uh, we made a second pass to, to uh, just to observe it a little more. And uh, so uh, about two years ago, uh, I went to a, a, my primary uh, flying school reunion down in Douglas, Georgia. And uh, I got to talking to uh, one of the fellows there and I said, what did you fly? And he said, a, a, a B-17. He said, but we got shot down on the second or third mission over Germany. And he said, I was a prisoner of war uh, for the balance of the war. And uh, he said, and then uh, then they took us and they, uh, when the, Ger the Russians were taking over Eastern Germany, they put us on a train and took us down to uh, the Munich area. And uh, so I, I said, well, uh, that's uh, sort of similar to what, what my experience was. I said, we were down there uh, on, and I had all my mission reports, like you see here along. And I pointed out this, this mission with him, and he said, well, that seems to be the same day that we were walking along as prisoner of wars. Uh, 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 and uh, he said, I'll give you a call when I get back to Pittsburgh. So a day or two after uh, he got home, he called, and he said, that matches exactly the day that I had on my report that we had flown over prisoners of war. Uh, in uh, in Germany. Now I did not know him in uh, in Douglas, Georgia, and I flew over him over there, and then finally I meet him at one of our reunions. That they, uh, which to me was one of my most interesting missions that I ever flew, uh, because I figured the odds were about a million to one that I would ever meet somebody like that. Well. My 101st mission was we attacked an airfield, and because the Germans were out of fuel and couldn't uh, fly the airplanes, we attacked all the airplanes on the ground. And on the last mission, we uh, 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 destroyed or damaged a total of 23 airplanes at, a, at an airfield in, in southern Germany. And uh, uh, shortly, after my last mission, uh, they uh, didn't schedule me no more. We had to fly a hundred missions. I flew the hundred and first just for a good measure, and uh, then I got my orders to go home. And I reported to Camp Stone in, in England, and got back to the states uh, uh, sometime in July uh, or the end of May. It might have been. Uh, I left uh, and was in England at, in London on May the 8th, which was a VE day. And then when I got home, I got the, the leave and then got orders to report to um, Miami Beach for reassignment. And I thought, well, here we go to, to the Pacific. So got down into um, Miami Beach for reassignment and the and uh, one of the sergeants says, uh, those who want to stay in, get in this line, and those who want to get out, get in this other line. I couldn't have gotten into the other line any faster, so uh, the next day or so, I had my orders to, to uh, go home. Uh, my terminal leave was up on BJ day, and I was a civilian again, so. And after that, I continued my uh, architectural education, uh, completed it in 1948, and uh, since that I've been working in architecture and been a registered architect uh, for these years, I retired in 1987. I still carry the license to practice if I want to, but I'm sort of glad to get out of that too. Uh, that's my story.
<laughs> what was your rank, John? Uh, you, first lieutenant. When you started and when you finished? No, second lieutenant when you started. And then uh, I, I was overseas 10 months, and we were in about 10 different locations throughout, uh, like, say, Corsica, Italy, uh, France, and they ended up at, uh, at Biblis. Our airfield was Biblis, uh, which was near Frankfurt in the, on the, in the end of April. And then my orders, I got to go home, sent home then. And uh, as I said, it was in uh, London on the way home when BJ Day was. But there, at the point I left, and there, we weren't even flying anymore. Uh, it was uh, uh, all over except for the the final agreement, with, you know, and signing uh, with the uh, uh, the com higher command and had everything in their hand. But uh, uh, at at that point, uh, some of the uh, fellows were even going out on uh, civilian. Uh, trips just to see what they could find. Now, the Germans at, at, at base at Biblis, uh, they were pretty shrewd because it, it was a, a forest with a, a hay field and they had all of their planes uh, in, this, uh, in this wooded area and it was right near the Audubon and uh, the Audubon instead of the medium being green grass it was green painted concrete and then they stuck uh, pine trees in uh, holes in there to make it look like a medium uh, and uh, and then when they wanted to fly they pulled the planes out and use that Audubon as a uh, an air uh, airstrip to take off and so they had everything worked out pretty cleverly uh, but uh, uh, other than that my, uh, there wasn't uh, much going on when, when I left. Uh, so you, you flew the P-47 for 101 missions, correct? Mm -hmm. Did you ever get shot at or uh, get damaged to your plane or I, come I'll, limping back in? Well, uh, we almost always got shot at by somebody. Now, uh, the, uh, as the uh, mayor of Harrison here had said uh, when they were in North Africa, uh, uh, they were in, I, apparently he was in the Navy, and uh, even our own Navy shot us down. He said they knocked down 24 of our planes, uh, meaning the Air Force, not our particular planes. But yes, almost every time you get shot at, uh, most of our, our, well, we would go out on dive bombing runs, and we'd go out of about 10,000 feet, and then uh, uh, we would, after we get flew past the target, we would do a rollover and come down about 70, 70 degree dive. <clears throat> and of course, at 10,000 feet, they, it was a, a 88 millimeter that could reach us at that point. But then when you got down at lower or on strafing missions, you were contending with uh, 20 miller, millimeter, uh, even handguns that could probably uh, do some damage. It, uh, and, and there's a lot of uh, a machine gun fire at that at that point, and uh, uh, the the uh, the point uh, that uh, I, I think I missed back uh, when we were uh, uh, strafing and dive bombing trains in in uh, Germany, we had attacked a. a, a, a train uh, locomotive with about 20 flat cars on it, flat cars on it, and they had tanks and other stuff on this train. And we went in to dive bomb that, and uh, uh, the train, uh, the locomotive blew up. Uh, there was a direct hit in the center of the, of the train, and then one on the end. And each time uh, there was a bunch of debris that would fly up. And uh, I was, uh, on that particular incident, I was in number three man coming in, and uh, I noticed something sort of hanging to, m to, to the right, my right side, and I hit it. And uh, 
and the tour about six foot of the right front section of the wing off. And uh, uh, at that point, it, it, it sort of uh, jolted the plane. Now, I guess if it wasn't a 47, I'd have taken the wing off, but the 47 was built like a truck. So it tore the, the front half of the right wing off for about six feet. And uh, I, uh, to control the plane, I had to use full left stick and full left rudder to get the plane righted. Now, the, uh, I headed for the uh, west side of the Rhine River because uh, intelligence had told us that if we got shot down in German territory, why the Germans would, the farmers were so mad that they'd use pitchforks on us and, and be sure and take your gun along. Well, I headed for the right uh, uh, bank of uh, the of Rhine River as soon as I could. And uh, I flew that, that plane uh, home. Uh, the the uh, mission leader said he uh, should bail out of it, but I figured that uh, as long as the thing was flying, I'd stick with it. And so uh, I could only fly at uh, 150 mile an hour with full throttle and full prop and everything because of the drag on the right wing. Because when you take out part of the, uh, the wing, the flat part of the wing, the, the, the truss that goes through there was acting as a brake. And so I flew this thing at, right down to the ground uh, at 150 mile an hour because I did not know when it would stall out and go into a spin. So uh, I, I, the plane would not set down at, uh, until I got about halfway down the runway. And of course, when you're in a P-47, your nose is higher than you are and you can't see what's out in the front. So. Uh, I got to the end of the runway not knowing where the end of the runway was and I hit a, an embankment there and uh, the plane went up in the air going about 50-60 mile an hour yet and then came down on the left wing and smashed it up so there was nothing left of the plane I, uh, and I walked away from it, no injuries, no nothing. So I got escaped the 101 missions with no no, no damage to me whatsoever. So. And it had to be very unusual for it to, for a pilot to, to make 101 missions without getting hurt, survive. I mean, probably a lot of people didn't have that kind of luck, did they? No, that made, uh, some of the fellows I went overseas with on a on a ship. We went over by ship. Uh, one got killed in in checking out the P-47 because he was not acquainted with the thing and it was so heavy that he was used to flying a light ship like uh, the P-40. He could do anything with that. You could slip it in for a landing if you were going to overshoot, but you could not crack up a P-47 when you were trying to come in for a landing because the speed was about 150, and if you banked too far, it'd just slip off and then crash into the ground. So one got killed that way. Another one, he... Uh, he was with the 86th, and uh, he got shot in the in the in the, uh, in the cockpit, uh, and and his his butt up, and then uh, I sent him to a hospital. And uh, after he was well enough to fly again, he flew, and then he got shot down and killed. Now our percentage of losses were probably about 20 uh, percent. Anybody that went over had about a 20% chance of getting shot down. We lost some missions. We'd lose two guys, uh, several, one guy. Uh, but when we were strafing these, uh, these uh, columns of uh, vehicles and things like this, we were always down on the treetop so anybody could hit us with anything they had. And uh, uh, so it was a, a matter of luck or somebody looking over I says so I, that's what I was counting on so did you have any air-to-air -air combat the, the, uh, well uh, we were fighter bombers we carried uh, two 500 pound bombs under each wing and then a belly tank 
uh, when we would go over uh, to Germany or uh, over Germany, why uh, their their fighters would uh, jump us to try to get us to drop the bombs because we, we were not very maneuverable with bombs and we had no chance to. So they would attack us from a high altitude, dive down, and if you'd see them coming, the first thing you had to do was drop the bombs. To go in, uh, uh, to be ready, you, so that you could uh, maneuver with uh, their fighters. So every time that would happen, why uh, they'd pull up and away they'd go. They saved their fighters to fight uh, to attack bombers, and and their tactic with uh, fighter to fighter, uh, us was just to get us to drop our uh, bombs or wing wing tanks too. Our belly tanks went with it too, so that we were we would fly on the belly tanks until they were empty, and then we'd switch over to the main tanks and. Uh, uh, sometimes we would carry uh, about four, 400 gallon, 450 gallon of, uh, uh, fuel. So we would save the main tank in case we got attacked and, and use uh, everything that was in the uh, auxiliary tanks uh, so that we could uh, uh, maneuver and uh, have enough fuel to get back home. Now, one time we got up into Germany and uh, I don't know what our target was supposed to be, but uh, the Germans attacked us, and uh, and we had to, we were supposed to switch uh, from uh, our our channels on the radio to pick up ground contact with a ground controller that was going to tell us what our target was going to be, and so uh, at this certain point we were supposed to switch. Uh, radio channels. Some of us had switched and some didn't. And the Germans came down right at this point and attacked us, so uh, uh, those of us that saw them coming in, we went into what they called the Loughberry Circle. It was a, uh, a very tight circle. Uh, and uh, the reason for that is because uh, when you, you have to lead an airplane like shooting a, a clay pigeon or that, you have to lead it by a certain number of feet or that, and you have to, our guns were all fixed so that uh, you had to pull up and get your nose to ahead of where he was going to fly so that you could lead him enough and shoot him down. Well, the left very circle is, uh, was trying to pull inside the other guy so you could shoot him, shoot him down. Well, we went in this Loughberry circle, and my, I had my plane actually, and it was stalling, but I had full power and full prop pitch and everything. And uh, so after making a few circles, why, uh, we look, and there's nobody in this circle but us. So they had to come down to get us to drop the bombs, and. We thought we were still being attacked, but they, they pulled up and went away. <laughs> How did the uh, uh, P-47 compare to the ME-109? Uh, I'd say probably the ME-109 was much more maneuverable. Uh, similar, uh, the P-51s were similar to that. Uh, now, uh, ME-109s had a 20 millimeter cannon plus another machine gun or something like that. But we had eight machine guns that could, and as I said, 3,400 rounds of 50 caliber. And actually, that, that it, the cone of fire one for those machine guns, of all of them converging, was at 1,500 feet. And at 1,500 feet, there wasn't much that would stand up to, to that. We could roll a truck off of the road by, uh, by the impact of these uh, uh, 50 millimeters on, in that cone of fire. Uh, and uh, so, uh, now, if a ME-109 chose to go into a dive, he was a dead duck because the P-47 at its weight and, and uh, horsepower could out-dive anything. And uh, we could, 
we could pull out uh, of a dive, not worry about pulling, shearing the wings off. Now, a, a lighter aircraft would, and when he's pulling out, there is a certain point where, you know, those wings are going to tear off of the thing in that dive, so he couldn't out-dive us, he, and there's no way that he could out-maneuver us on the, in a dive, you know. So, uh, they didn't have much chance in a dive, but uh, uh, our tactic was, was never to go after fighters. We were supposed to go out after locomotives, trucks, and, and keep supplies from getting to their uh, German troops on the front line, and, uh, and supplies like gasoline and things like this from getting to their vehicles along the front line, and that's why so many of them got stalled when they got caught all the time like that. They, many, many times, uh, in every incident, when that would happen, they'd be pulling their vehicles with horse-drawn vehicles, and the more than you'd open up with, um, with the eight machine guns, why the horses would tear loose, and then we, we went, <laughs> I shouldn't say it, but we went after the horses then, because that was part of their military equipment. And, uh, Late in the war, the Germans came out with the first jet. Yeah. And they say it could just outrun anything we had. Did you ever see, have any encounters with that lately uh, anymore? I, we saw them, but uh, they, uh, uh, they had an ME-262, one, one, uh, which was a twin-engine uh, uh, fighter. They had a, I think it was a, a 163, which was a little, uh, little uh, plane that they would take up. And it had a very limited amount of fuel, and they would have, uh, uh, I, I guess it only had about eight, eight or ten minutes of fuel. And after that, why? They, they had to either bail out or, or something. It was sort of a, a little rocket plane, you might say. But uh, one of my friends, and I found this out later, he was uh, flying a P-51, uh, and uh, he shot down a 262 with a P-51. Uh, and I don't know how that ever happened. I never got to talk to him, but I, in reading different uh, articles and uh, magazines and that uh, on, on the Air Force, why his name was in there and he was credited with shooting. The only guy I believe had shot down a 262 with a, a conventional plane. You know, the, on the TV shows and the movies about World War II, the pilots are always con uh, portrayed as the Mavericks and the um, hot shot, uh, super slick, you know, ultra good looking, you know, the guys that were just brave and bold and daring and dashing. Do you think that was true, pretty much? Well, I tell you, uh, uh, there was, there were hot pilots who, you know, had the, the white scarf around their, uh, their neck and, and, uh, and then there were conservative pilots, and I guess I was one of them, uh, the conservative ones, because the hot pilots either killed themselves, uh, like uh, some of these, uh, in, when we got over to Europe and uh, or Corsica, uh, and you were uh, too hot of a pilot and you racked that 47 around, and I mentioned before that one of them bore a hole in the ground on the approach because he racked it around. And uh, then there were guys like this Jim Rudolph that I mentioned. He was a wild man, and he would go after anything. Uh, and uh, he did a lot of things that uh, were not uh, too good to, to practice. And I know one time we were, uh, we were over Germany, and there was a big uh, layer of clouds over the entire area and we were supposed to, we had a, a dive bombing mission but we couldn't find it because of the cloud. So we dropped the bombs anyway and then we went down on the uh, deck through a little hole in the cloud uh, and uh, when we got uh, through there we saw a train that was in the woods and, uh, and uh, 
so he said, uh, let's, let's, go down, let's get this thing. And so we, we uh, uh, you, you were never supposed to go back for a second attack, uh, I mean, because they, they were ready for you at the second attack. So we get down and he makes a circle and uh, we came back uh, on a second circle there and he took his uh, four, uh, four planes in and it, it looked like 4th of July with the, the, the fireworks, the tracers and everything going on. And uh, I said to him, I said, uh, uh, that's a trap. And I said, do you want me to go in? He said, no, let's get the heck out of here. So, <laughs> so you know, so that's about it. Do you have any questions? We, we have more time on the yeah. video. Uh, by having the P-47, a uh, truck as you called it, uh, and the gasoline, as large of engine it as it had, uh, you had a, a shorter range than what most uh, pilots, most fighter pilots had. Am I right? That's right. Uh, of course, if we were, uh, I was only on one escort mission out of the 101, and that was in Italy uh, just prior to New Year's Day on uh, 1945. And uh, our mission, there were four of us, our planes that were supposed to go up and fly cover for some C-47s that were circling up in the mountain, Apennine Mountains in, in, in northern Italy. And every time these C-47s would go around their pattern, they would kick off uh, supplies to the partisans, the Italian partisans in Italy. And uh, uh, two of our planes on the way there developed uh, engine problems and went back. So I and another man were really flying uh, escort or top cover for the C-47. I'm not too sure if we'd have been attacked by a bunch of ME-109s or anything, how would it come out, but as it was, we had no problem, you know, they didn't attack us or anything like this, so, uh, so it, uh, I don't know if I answered your question or not, she did. but uh, uh, as I said, our, our Air Force uh, was a 12th tactical, meaning that uh, you attacked anything that was supplying the, our frontline troops, or you could interrupt their uh, their uh, uh, provisions for uh, resupplying the troops or their front their vehicles or anything like that. Strategic uh, Air Force was like the Eighth Air Force out of England. They were all bombers. They would uh, bomb uh, industry uh, in, in Germany or take out some uh, thing like that, meaning that strategic meaning uh, over a long period of time uh, it would uh, destroy their capability to manufacture things. And so that's what the, the bombers were doing. Ours was really strictly to, uh, to supply uh, to help frontline troops. Sometimes we would have a, a pilot up in the front lines uh, uh, directing us what our targets were supposed to be when we get there. And if they had a, a target, then we would have to try to find it. I mean, there would, might be some tanks holding up uh, progress. Now, uh, you wonder whether a 50 caliber uh, a bullet is going to hurt a tank. Uh, but if you put enough 50 caliber uh, bullets down and some of them get under the tank where he was vulnerable, uh, you're going to set him up, take, explode his uh, fuel tanks and, and, and that's how you could get them. The other thing was you might knock off their, their tracks, you know, if you put it in. So we had enough bullets flying that uh, they were effective even on the tank but trucks or motorcycles and things like this were no match for it. I, I went after uh, uh, Germans sent messengers out on uh, off times with motorcycles and when uh, and uh, 
it was their duty to get through and deliver their message. Well, if you'd see them and you attacked them, they would try to pour on the gas and outrun it. But we could kick the rudder and we could spray bullets, from, you know, for a, a full square, and he had no chance whatsoever to get escaping that. Uh, first thing he should have done was get off a motorcycle and headed for a ditch. <laughs> and but uh, so it was an experience that I'm glad I had. Uh, but I, I don't think I want to do it again. Well, maybe, you know, at 81, you have not much to lose. <laughs> <laughs> have you ever flown a plane since you got back? Only, only once in Florida. Uh, uh, a, uh, a friend of mine who was in the service with me has a, a private plane down in, uh, in Daytona Beach. And uh, a few years ago, we were at a reunion down there. And he said, come on over and uh, I'll take you up for a ride. Well, he lives on uh, in a, a condo complex that each of these uh, uh, units has their own hangar in their backyard. Uh, he, he flew for a commercial airliner afterwards. So, uh, so that was something new to me to have, instead of having a car in the garage, he had an airplane in the hangar behind his house. <laughs> and so we went up and flew around, uh, and then he let me fly a thing for a while. But what I do now, there's a program uh, Microsoft has out where you can fly, actually fly a P-47 by computer. And uh, uh, anybody that uh, you can fly an MAU-109 and attack B-17s, uh, you can fly a mess, uh, that's the ME-109, uh, you can fly a Spitfire or a P-51, uh, and, and it's exactly like, I mean the instrument panel and everything is exactly the same, so anybody that's ever interested in that, it's a Microsoft World War II uh, training uh, uh, film. So you're working on your next 101 missions via the internet, or the computer. Huh? <laughs> yeah, I do mine on the safe way now. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you, John, for talking to us, and thank you for your service to our country. All right, thank you. Thank you for inviting me. I think we have